worms in a healthy uh, environment, in a healthy worm bin, will keep that bin from going anaerobic as long as there's plenty of airflow um, and plenty of drainage for your liquid or your moisture to drain. In this episode, Nina Prater, a sustainable agriculture specialist in the INCAT Southeast office in Fayetteville, Arkansas, talks with Matt Castile, owner of Wormworks, a composting business in Jackson, Mississippi. They talk about composting and how to identify good compost, what chocolate can you compare it to to check for color, for example, the ins and outs of worm composting, why compost is so good for soil health, and how important composting is for food waste diversion. Let's listen. Hello, everybody. I'm Nina Prater, MCAT specialist out of our Fayetteville, Arkansas office, and I'm here today with Matt Castile, who is the owner of Wormworks, a composting uh, business in Jackson, Mississippi. Thanks for joining me today, Matt. Nina, thanks so much. I appreciate you having me on. Well, I am really excited to talk to you today about composting, about compost, about soil and specifically worm composting, because um, I know you you do a lot of that and have a lot of wisdom to share with us. Um, so first, though, I'd just like to hear a little bit about your background and, and how you got into how you got interested in composting in the first place. Sure. Yeah. It is always an interesting road for anyone that uh, spends their life and career with compost and worms. <laughs> and so <laughs> how did I get here? Well, this is a relatively um, new endeavor for me about four years ago now. Um, prior to that, I was um, in the hunger relief field as an international humanitarian um, through a large nonprofit. And, you know, after those many years, I wanted to focus in Jackson, and I wanted to still be a part of the food system in some some way. Um, a big part of what we do at Wormworks is focused on food justice, food apartheid, and food access, um, combating things like redlining in our, our communities, mm -hmm. um, and access to fresh best vegetables. So, here in Jackson, there's a lot of organizations that work on, you know, uh, there's there are soup kitchens, there are relief closets, there's uh, gleaning organizations that glean food from fields. There's a lot of folks on the, the feeding side, the service side, the farming side. Um, mm -hmm. There weren't a lot of folks dealing with the back end of what we know uh, that's a huge part of farming in general. And that's what do we do with our waste? Mm -hmm. um, not just in farming, but everyday life. Every person creates organic waste, right? Whether we don't eat that uh, all your food, you're prepping dinner with your kitchen scraps. So I quickly realized that this is a big deficit in our food system in our area especially mm -hmm. and I wanted to be a person that um, would highlight creative uh, ways to combat this so uh, we operate a kitchen scrap collection program we work with small businesses in and around Jackson uh, small farms and divert their organic waste from the landfill um, so it's a big part of combating climate change which we right. can talk a little bit more about uh, when you de uh, decompose organic material improperly or compost improperly, um, we can release some of those really bad gases that contribute to climate change. So uh, that was one big um, thing that I wanted to, to address in my local community. The, the other thing is to give people a resource locally on, you know, up in their compost game. Mm -hmm. You know, there's... There's a lot of folks that, you know, yeah, we got a compost pile in our backyard and, you know, getting to where we're creating resources and um, information that can help people compost better. So it's, it's a nugget of, of things that uh, this journey has led me down this path of food justice and uh, food security and, um, 
and diverting landfill waste. And it was just a great opportunity when I found worm composting mm -hmm. and that, you know, worm composting is a major type of composting. It's different than what you might think about in turning hot compost or leaving a static pile. Um, worms are cold compost. Uh, you know, there are certain temperature ranges they can be in and certain things they can process. And um, there's a, a certain way to manage cold composting. So I wanted to use these tools to get me to a place where, hey, you know, we are, we have opportunities to build on this, you know, opportunity to create closed loop systems in our right. community. So we're part of a collective organization in um, a, a group of collective organizations in Jackson that are focused on uh, air, water, soil uh, regeneration and conservation. Um, so it's, it's about activating those possibilities in that creative space. And it gives us the opportunity to tell people about worm composting. <laughs> Which more people need to know about. So, <laughs> sure. sure. yeah, that's so interesting how, um, you know, one year, one piece of the puzzle composting ties in with all the other pieces, you know, it's not just this isolated process. It's, you know, diverting food waste from the landfill, you know, and then turning it into something that can then help promote self-reliance, uh, sustainability, you know, it can, uh, food security, if people are growing their own food, that's, that's really, that's really great that you're able to fit that niche in Jack. Sure. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it's creating an environment where we promote rejuvenation, regeneration, Mm -hmm. These practices of, hey, we we could throw this, you know, X, Y and Z organic waste out. We could throw these cardboard out or this shred of paper out or we could turn it into food for plants <laughs> um, and, and create more food. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the idea. It's kind of how we got to where we are today and partnerships with local organizations like juice shops, coffee shops, landscaping organizations, small farms, contributing to then create a product that's going into other small farms in the area to grow more food that then they purchase at their local market or right. um, through CSAs. Pretty neat opportunity. That's really cool. Are people, do people get excited about it when they're participate, starting to participate or learning? I would just say if you've ever, if you've ever stopped by our booth at the Mississippi State Farmers Market <laughs> and you, you were just curious and you let me start talking at you, then, <laughs> then you probably you probably got an earful. Maybe you were there for, you know, 10 more minutes than you thought you might be. <laughs> um, but yeah, people get excited. And it's really, you know, a lot of what we want to do is the education component of why we're doing what we're doing and, mm -hmm. and why we would create a for-profit business and, and put, you know, create a lifestyle as a small business owner to do this type of thing every day. And it's really the kids, when we get in schools, we, we've been in a number of JPS schools and surrounding schools that, um, either have learning gardens or uh, we do a one-on-one -on -one off workshop with the kids um, each year and talk about worms and talk about composting and talk about what else we purchase when we purchase a product. It's not just that product itself, it's the product packaging and, you know, juxtapose what different waste is. Mm -hmm. This organic waste can be, you know, transformed into something else. And this inorganic waste, can't necessarily have the same second life or third or fourth or infinite. So, and it, I always find that the younger folks pick up on it really quickly. I had a young lady, uh, one of my last workshops uh, before COVID and we were in person and she had, she, she raised her hand and asked a question after, and <laughs> uh, it was about uh, bees and worms. Uh, and she said, you know, do you think that worms are the bees of the soil? Oh. <laughs> and I just, I just thought that that was the most profound question. And it, you know, it sparked a lot of uh, 
creativity in my own brain when I was analyzing that question and thinking about, man, what a cool juxtaposition. What a yeah. cool parallel to make. So yeah, that's uh, always... very insightful. So that's a great segue uh, into talking about soil. Um, I, I wanted to ask you um, to explain. Um, so I'm a soil specialist. I talk about soil health a lot with farmers and such. And I talk, a lot, I recommend that farmers use compost a lot as a soil amendment, but I would love to hear from you on the composting side. Why, uh, if you could explain why compost is so good for soil in, in, in the different ways that it is. Sure, yeah. And we need more people pushing compost, okay? Good compost and helping to to push the narrative of what compost is. So if you think about your soil profile, you're looking at 25% water, 25% air, 45% minerals and mineral particles, um, and just about 5% or less, mostly, most of the time, less is organic material. And so using compost, first, it can build that. It can build your organic uh, material layer, right? Mm -hmm. So that's uh, stabilized carbons. That's the humus you hear about. That's uh, organisms, right? That's the life in your soil. Um, so using compost can build the life in your soil. It can build the organic material. It can build, um, you know, structure. So when we're thinking about Mississippi soils, a lot of our soil where we are is clay. It compacts a lot. We really need to work on what's called flocculation and um, creating those pathways in the soil and that structure in the soil. Compost can do that. Why can compost do that? It's because it's teeming with organisms. It's teeming with life. Good, uh, good book for folks to look at is Jeff Lowenfeld's Teeming with Microbes, Teeming with Fungi. Gives great insights onto uh, into how that kind of works on a basic level for the layperson gets into the weeds a little bit, but for most people, you read it, you have a basic idea of biology, you're going to be able to, to get what the guy's saying, and it's really well done. So compost not only is bringing structure, bringing life, uh, bringing water holding capacity, creating habitat, right? And, and so all of those things go on to equal fertility, go on to equal health uh, of plants. So compost so important because it can inoculate our otherwise depleted soils with organisms, nutrients, organic material. Right. And you said at the beginning of that description, good compost sure. can do all of those things. Can you help sure. distinguish between what, what makes a good compost and what makes a bad compost? Sure. Uh, Good compost, you want to look for a number of things. Primarily, you want to use the majority of your five senses. And when you're looking at compost, you can look at it. There is a chocolate profile. There's a brown profile about 70, 72% <laughs> for real. Cocoa, right? Mm -hmm. So yep. that dark chocolate cocoa color, that's what you're looking for. If it's black, really, you definitely need to look under the microscope. Um, you need to look under the microscope regardless, but that chocolatey color, the feel of compost, okay? This is just when you're going somewhere, you're at a store, you're saying, man, I can't decide between this compost, this compost, what's the difference, right? I will always say you really need to get a biological analysis, which is looking under the microscope, seeing what life is there. But if you don't have that initially, that cocoa color, that the, the structure. So when you pick up a handful of the compost, when you squeeze that, what happens? Does it form a ball? Does it just kind of disintegrate in your hands? Um, does a bunch of water squeeze out? Right. So when you're looking at good compost, you want that at a lower moisture. So if you're squeezing it and you got water droplets coming out of your hands, that's a way too wet compost. And you might want to reconsider that option because it might not be finished composting. It might have been stored improperly um, and it might not have been cured properly. 
So uh, you really want to look for when you squeeze it, it balls up, holds in a ball. And when you push your, you know, kind of break it up, it easily breaks up in your hand. Right. If there's a little bit of moisture starting to gather in the creases of your fingers, that's what you'll look. That's that's OK. If it's very dry, really think about that. Life requires moisture. When you're thinking about color, if it's really light colored, maybe reconsider. All right. And next smell. Right. When, when you smell, what are you what do you want to smell? Now, just the other day, I grabbed a bag of compost that is sold in every box store that you can find for the most part. And I smelled that compost and it smelled like uncomposted manure, mm -hmm. right? So when you smell compost and you smell manure smells, you smell the maybe butric acid or some of these other acids that are the vomit smells and the, <laughs> the gross smells. Yeah. Right? That, that means that material is either A, not fully composted, or B, has gone anaerobic, right, mm. or both, most likely both, because for those smells to be created, that means an anaerobic environment existed, okay, most likely it continues to exist to that point where it's still emitting those smells, so smell, sight, feel, those are your first, first things to look at, the next piece to really tell if it's great compost you need to look at it under the microscope or have someone do a biological analysis. Or if the company you're buying it from doesn't provide one, ask them for an analysis of that batch that you bought. Mm -hmm. right? That's important. You find the key to great compost is the complete soil food web, which by that I mean all of the beneficial organisms that are going to make uh, a complete environment that's going to make plants happy, that's going to suppress disease, that's going to suppress pests. Mm -hmm. Okay, That means beneficial bacteria of a lot of varieties, beneficial fungi with a lot of varieties, protozoa with a lot of varieties, nematodes, beneficial nematodes with a lot of varieties, um, microarthropods and macroarthropods. All of these guys, it's important to be present. So that's great compost. And that's, that's not something you get with, you know, backyard composting when you build a pile of leaves and put kitchen scraps in the middle and then cover them with leaves. You can get good compost from that, but if you don't manage it correctly, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, negative things that can go down. Like if it goes anaerobic or uh, if it doesn't get hot enough, that kind of thing. Sure. Both of those are the top um, issues. You know, going anaerobic, when you think about cold composting, worm composting, worms are aerobic animals, right? They, they, they cannot live in a low or no oxygen environment. They just can't do it. They're relying upon oxygen at a certain part per million. Worms in a healthy uh, environment, in a healthy worm bin, will keep that bin from going anaerobic as long as there's plenty of airflow um, and plenty of drainage for your liquid or your moisture to drain, right? Uh, in a hot compost, when you're talking about going anaerobic, it can happen a lot very quickly. And that's why we turn hot compost. So we wanna incorporate air, we wanna incorporate indigenous microorganisms, we wanna um, eliminate pests, pathogens, parasites. Mm -hmm. So. That's why when you're doing a hot compost process, things need to be a little bit more organized in how you create the heat, how long it's sustained when you turn it and the moisture level. Worms, you also need to maintain moisture level, temperature, habitat, um, but with a hot compost, you're, you're, you, know, you need to be really on top of your temperature measurement. Previously, we had really use temperature to figure out when to turn compost, hot compost. We do that less now. Elaine Ingham and her crew with the Soil Food Web have done a lot of research lately on minimum turns based on what temperature for how long. Mm -hmm. And so it's really, it's really streamlined a lot of how we think about thermal composting. So I'll say if you don't manage your hot compost correctly, 
what happens when those kitchen scraps that we don't divert from the landfill go to the landfill and they're put amongst all this other garbage and smashed maybe 10, 20, 30 feet down, um, there's no way for oxygen to flow. So who thrives in that environment? Anaerobic organisms thrive at that environment, in that environment. And, uh, you know, the majority of pest pathogens, parasites are, they thrive in those conditions, right? Mm -hmm. So not only that, but when those organisms thrive, they enable greenhouse gases to be created and released. Are you talking right? about methane specifically? Methane. Is that the primary one? Sulfur or gases. Oh, yeah. Phosphine gases. Uh, there are a number of, uh, of gases that can be released that are greenhouse gases. I mean, regular thermal compost, uh, cold compost, all types of compost release CO2. And, you know, that's that's a byproduct of uh, humans breathing as well. So you think about the microorganisms, they process that the same way. So they're breathing, they're, they're res respiring. In those reduced oxygen environments, the bad guys thrive. You not only then create a great environment for pests and pathogens, you are then heating our environment. So you can kill those uh, negative, uh, negative consequences by composting properly. Great. So let's dive into the world of worm composting. I, uh, sure. I am really excited to learn more about that. Um, we actually have a worm bin here at the uh, NCAT Southeast office um, yeah. in our office and we just feed it, you know, banana peels and, you know, stuff, <laughs> apple sure. cores and our snacks and then keep rip up newspapers and it's just in like a plastic tote bin set in another bin. So it's a really simple setup, but it's it works really well here. Um, so I've seen the simple, the simplest probably set up for worm composting, but I'd like to know what what other options um, are out there for people to to experiment with. And, and let's talk about also just the characteristics of the worms that are commonly used and the, you know, the just sort of the conditions you have to keep them in. I know you mentioned like a temperature range and stuff like that. So let's go over some of the worm composting basics to get to get people hooked on this idea. <laughs> sure. You know, when I first started, I started with a small seven gallon plastic tote. Uh, inside of another seven gallon plastic tote. Mm -hmm. One of, some of those that stack. I think that's what you're uh, describing there that you guys have on site. Yeah. So there are a number of different ways that you can raise worms and compost with worms. So it de really depends on what goal you're trying to accomplish. Okay. So there can be folks that uh, just want to compost their kitchen scraps in their household. There could be an organization that wants to compost their whole organization or school's uh, compost from the kitchen and put it into a garden space. Um, there are some folks that want to create, just create fertilizer for their plant. Good, great compost for their plants. I think everyone should start small and build up from there. The beautiful thing about worms is that every worm can lay an egg and that's how worms reproduce. It only takes two. Each worm can create uh, an egg and each worm can fertilize that egg. So in terms of bins, when you're first starting the, uh, you know, you can use the plastic totes in the stacking method. There are a number of products out there. The worm towers, I'm sure you've heard and um, the worm bodegas, I think I've seen or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's so many choices, but I think first about the materials that we use to build or to make the bin out of, right? If you're really wanting to steer clear of plastic, which I try and do, not just because most plastic can have a second life, a single use for the most part, it, it also fluctuates temperature. It doesn't insulate very well. So you, you know, think about that if you're going to keep the bin inside, which you can do, uh, then that might not be as big of an issue. If you're going to keep the bin in a garage space or an outdoor space, a patio, you know, in a wooded part of your uh, backyard or area where you live, 
you know, you might want to rethink that. Here in Mississippi, we have temperatures out the roof, right? Hundreds of this time of year regularly. So putting that plastic bin outside is really going to fluctuate temp. Worms don't like temp fluctuations, okay? Mm -hmm. We use wood, untreated wood for our bins. And it depends on what you want to do with that. You can use pretty much any type of wood. Uh, I think if you use, I would recommend if you use pine or cedar, maybe age it just a little bit, just so you can get rid of some of those um, natural chemicals that are pest suppressants. So we definitely suggest build you a little wood bin if you can. You can, you know, once that um, wood is starting to decompose with the beneficial fungus and the bacteria and the worms and everybody working together, that piece of wood can kind of go back into the, to the, you know, your bin. Um, so just think about what, what you want to accomplish with your materials. Now, if you're going to build your own bin, I, it's, it's relatively easy. Uh, all you need to think about is a box. You can do it as small or as large as you want it. I would say at least do, at least do a one by one, you know, two by two uh, size bin. The plastic bins, of course, make that a little bit easier. So, you, you know, you just grab your plastic bins, you stack them, you make sure Sure, the top bin where your material is has holes drilled in the bottom uh, so that that extra moisture can drain off. If you use a wooden bin, uh, think about the drainage there as well, because you might need to put something underneath there to catch uh, the leachate, which is the material that comes out after watering your worms. Most of the time, we don't have a lot of that in very mature worm beds. But when you're first establishing a worm bed, you're going to have some runoff and you need a place for that to go. Again, start as small as you want. Start as big as you want. Just know that right now there is a, a North American red worm shortage that's mm. still going on. Wow. Uh, because people are seeing the beauty in worm composting and the practicality uh, in worm composting and households are really doing it a lot more. There are businesses like mine that are popping up that... Um, need to be supplied initially with a clue of worms, um, which is kind of like a herd, right? I was going to say, is that the worm, the worm <laughs> word? <laughs> it's, it's one of them. You really can, there are a number of interchange ones, but clue came from mythology and Theseus. It really comes from the origination of the C-L-U-E word. Um, huh. And Theseus had a ball of yarn and had to go through a labyrinth. Oh, right? yeah. The Minotaur's uh, right? labyrinth. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. There you go. And so yeah. to find his way, he tied that yarn in the beginning and took it with him everywhere he went. So he could have a clue of where the exit uh -huh. was, right? Um, and so a clue is a ball of yarn, but because a bunch of worms together in a space tend to get together like a and look like a ball of yarn that kind of had been uh, taken up and used to describe a bunch of worms together. Well, that's so, very fascinating. Clue of <laughs> <laughs> now, where were we? So oh, bins. Okay, bins, yeah. <laughs> you got to think about bedding. Bedding is what goes in your bin for your worm to live in. So you think about the type of worms that we use are red wigglers. Okay, they're an earthworm. Um, some people also use blues. They're also a composting worm. They're earthworms. And uh, the red worms tend to be a little bit better at cooler temperatures. Blues tend to be a little bit better at warmer temperatures. And so uh, we've been experimenting with a little bit of a, a mixture of, of each since we get pretty extreme sometimes each year around here in Mississippi. So um, when you think about what they live in, they live in the top, you know, really a lot of people say six to eight inches, but I've found really is the one to two inches mm -hmm. in, in, in what a lot of spaces in, in developed forests are called the duff, that, right. that environment of decomposing material on the ground above that topsoil, that's uh, decomposing material is habitat. And so you want to recreate that, just fancy word biomimic, biomimicry. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a lot of what we're doing with this process is you're mimicking nature. You wanna mimic the forest floor for your worms. That's the environment they love um, and thrive in because there's lots of decomposing material to feed them 
Um, and one piece of information as we go forward to consider is that worms are predators. Worms are actually predating microbes. They're, while they do take in your food scraps and those brown materials and whatever will fit in their mouth, it's really for the microbe juices. Mm, so they yeah. are in, <laughs> they are in it for those delicious microbe juices. So huh. as the decomposing material is habitat for those beneficial bacteria, those bacteria, those fungi, all those microbes that then feed the worms and the uh, nematodes and the protozoa, which then uh, get pooped out into plant available nutrients. So in the worm bin, things like decaying leaves, uh, bark, uh, sticks and wood chips, and uh, like you mentioned, shredded paper and cardboard, sans tape, right? Uh, or any kind of sheeny sticker that might contain metallic inks. Get all of that, as much diversity with those materials as you possibly can. Mm. And one thing that I do prior to prepping a new bin is I like to put those materials that I'm going to use in a five gallon bucket or a bin and fill that just over the material with fresh water. Okay. Let that material sit overnight or a couple of days and soak and saturate those bedding materials, those brown materials, and then pour off the excess water, then put it in your bin. Okay. Now that is bedding. And while it will end up food, because that's also food for microbes, especially fungi, we want to make sure we add greens or more nitrogenous foods mm -hmm. uh, that then attract more bacteria. Um, and other microorganisms to, uh, to help feed the worms. So you got your bedding in there, it's saturated. You got your holes in the bottom so any excess moisture can drain. Uh, you got whatever is grabbing that leachate. We'll talk about leachate later because that's an important thing to note that a lot of big misconceptions about leachate. Okay. Um, and then you'll wanna introduce your worms, okay? Before you feed, them any other food scraps or any nitrogen materials before you incorporate any of those other materials in you're going to want to let your worms get situated in your bedding material now if you want to speed this process up you can inoculate that material with good compost extract or uh, add a sprinkle a little bit of compost in there to get those that inoculated that material inoculated with beneficial microorganisms the worms will settle in i usually give them three to seven days to settle in. Then I progressive feed them around the bin. So start in one corner and feed about half the weight of the amount of worms you have in your bin. So a pound of worms is about 850 to 1,000 worms. And 850 to 1,000 worms can eat somewhere between a quarter and a half of their weight every day. Wow. Okay. So, and then that's in a mature bin. So when you first start a bin, you want to really start slow. So maybe put a quarter in the first corner. You want to cover that up with a little bit of the browns um, and don't bury it deep. Just top it with a little bit of your brown material. Uh, let the worms travel over, you know, take care of that material and don't feed again until that material is gone. Then feed in the next corner, then the next, then the next in the same fashion, okay? You do this a number of times and you'll stop feeding it for a little while if you wanna harvest your finished compost. And typically, you know, two to three weeks should be fine. And you can take that out and harvest it. Um, if you have a little screener, which is just hardware cloth, a quarter inch is fine and make you a little screener and screen that stuff and put the big stuff back in your bin and start up. The worms will be screened out for the most part as well. And if they're not, you can put, put it all in a pile and shine a light on it or put it, I don't love putting it in the sun because UV can really damage your microbes, but which is whatever, but, uh, you can put a, you can shine a light on it as well, just so the worms go down 
you slough off the top of the mound with no worms and you continue to do that. So the worms will continue to go down based on the light being exposed and you've harvested some material. So that's the basics of a worm bin. You wanna make sure you keep the moisture at 70 to 80%. That's because worms are made of 70, 80% moisture. They, they breathe out of their skin. They uh, do a lot of different things on their skin surface. And in fact, when worms travel through your bedding material, anything that touches the worm, it's not just anything that goes through the worm, but anything that touches the outside of the worm gets inoculated with that worm's microbiome. And that's the reason why the worms are so important and so good at composting and creating high quality compost is because their microbiome that they inherit from their mother is complex, is super diverse. Um, it's one of, if not the most diverse microbiome that we know of in the soil. Wow. So, so you take that and you inoculate your material by going through the worm digestive system or the worm slithering by it and having its biofilm and microbiome uh, inoculate that material. So as you manage your bin, there will be a number of issues. You know, you're not going to get it right the first time. You know, you're going to overfeed them, which is going to attract some fruit flies, which is going to attract some other stuff. So if you have it inside, it's a good practice to have a lid, especially. It's good to have a lid on it regardless. I, I do my bins open, but I do have them in a greenhouse. So if you have a covering, like a garage, you can leave your bin open. Uh, but if it's inside and you, you want to make sure you cut down on fruit flies and other guys, you A, want to not overfeed. B, if you do overfeed, you know, add more of the brown bedding material. Okay, that'll help soak up moisture. That'll help, help solve that as well. I think another big thing is worms escaping. Okay, we, we've heard so many horror stories of somebody having a worm bin, they put their worms in there and the next morning they come in to see worms on the ceiling and on oh the goodness. wall and like <laughs> everywhere. So, you know, it might be uh, good for you in the beginning if you're inside to and it's in a relatively dark space, which it kind of needs to be in a shady, cooler spot. Maybe in the beginning, have you a light that shines right on top of the bin so that the worms kind of stay in their place until they get comfortable. Mm -hmm. Now, when you have a mature worm bin and you're feeding correctly and their food source is there in the bin, they're not going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. So if they're escaping, there's something, you know, going down and most of the time it's overfeeding. Interesting. Yeah. And there's some food scraps that worms don't like, right? I feel like I remember uh, when, you know, you're not supposed to put onions in or something like that. Is that true? <laughs> Am I remembering that right? So anything that was a plant or an animal can be composted with worms or hot composted or any composted in any way. The thing with worms and, and the reason why people say don't add a lot of citrus or don't add a lot of onion or broccoli, <laughs> these kind of things are very aromatic. They're very fragrant when they start to decompose. And so it becomes an issue if that bin is inside and if the bin is not mature. So a mature bin and a large enough bin, you can, in my bins, I feed my worms juice pulp straight a lot of times. And you know, a lot of that is very acidic. A lot of that is a lot of uh, citrus. Uh, in the mature beds, it's no problem. Mm. So I would say those type of things, be aware that they can cause stronger smells. Just make sure you cover them more with brown material. Mm -hmm. But in your mature worm bin, at small amounts, you can incorporate those things in and they will take care of them. And it, because think again, it's microbes for the most part doing the decomposition, mm -hmm. the worms themselves come in. And when those, that, that decomposing material is to a, a particular point, it's got a lot of microbes on there. They're like, okay, let's go. I can fit this in my mouth. They're rolling mm -hmm. uh, at that point. So citrus, very, very tough to do as well, unless you have a mature bin, but in small amounts, 
it can be composted. So, you know, don't get too scared of those things. And I think those type of things as well, it's important to maybe consider a, a different type of composting in addition to worm composting. You know, maybe you have, a, a, you know, a hot compost out back as well, or a static compost, or, a, you know, maybe a Bokashi uh, compost going that you can put that stuff in as well. So maybe consider tiering if you have a lot of that different type of food waste tearing the way you compost. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you said you wanted to go back to the leachate issue. Sure. Let's yes. talk about that. <laughs> well, the, you know, and it comes from the lack of defining our industry in a lot of ways. Uh, and, and I say our industry in vermiculture and vermicomposting. Vermiculture is more about raising the worms whether it's for fishing or food for other animals uh, or supplying people like me with composting worms. Um, vermicomposting is traditionally composting with worms solely, right? You're not really growing the worms to then sell. You're growing, you know, you're feeding the worms to compost. And then once the population gets large enough, you split that bin and, you know, grow your operation or donate some to your neighbor. As far as leachate goes, the reason why I highlighted those two ways of working with worms is because they have different, slightly different management of those different systems. Okay. So you're going to feed the worms a little something different in a vermiculture process. You're going to feed the worms a little something different in an operation like I have that processes food waste. Um, so when you get leachate, that's the, that's the liquid that drains from the bottom of your bin, your worm bin. Now, if you're feeding worms, if you are in the process of feeding worms, if you have raw food in your worm bin, if you feed weekly and you water at the same time, or um, you don't have all finished compost in your worm bin, there is a heightened risk that that leachate contains pest pathogens, parasites that have been on the surfaces of those food materials, those things that you have put in your worm bin that aren't completely composted. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it increases your risk of those type of issues. Now, so if you have a worm bin and you just fed in your second corner, the food's still there, but you know your worms need a little bit of moisture. So you water, you add a little water in there. Well, you can think some of that material has not been composted, not gone through the worm, not been touched by the worm, not been decomposed by the microbiology. That could potentially have the pest pathogens, et cetera. So taking that material and then putting it in your food garden is not a great practice, okay? So be wary. If you have a compost bin, a worm bin that has not been fed for a number of weeks, that is, you know, is relatively all finished worm compost, that's going to be, if you then water through there and you get a little bit of leachate, that, that's going to be a, a little bit better, you know, less risk in doing that. Mm -hmm. It's going to give you a look, you know, and that might be a point at which, you know, some folks who manage a vermiculture business, they might feed their worms a little something different. And the, the process of feeding allows them to eat everything in X amount of time. And then they water and then that leachate comes out and they grab it and capture it and then use it in the garden, which that can make sense. But always be wary of using leachate from a worm bin that doesn't have completely decomposed or composted material in it. Right. Yeah. You don't want to risk put, getting E. coli on your lettuce or something like that from your, exactly. from your worm bin. So, yeah, that's a now, really good food safety tip. Sure. And don't get me wrong, it's going to wash some humic acids, some fulvic acids, some hormones and lipids and nutrients. And some of those things will get, you know, into that liquid. And so there's some good stuff there. So if you really want to use this material, use it to rewater your other worm bins or to rewater your bin, then uh, maybe put it on flowers or a perennial bush that doesn't produce food. Right, right. That makes sense. Um, and, you know, I, I know people probably have heard of compost tea and, and 
maybe worm worm tea. <laughs> So, Lisa, so many names. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> and it all sounds so appetizing. Um, but, but the, um, so leachate is different than that. Can you talk about like the compost tea making process a little bit? Sure. So once you've composted and you have a finished compost product, that's when you would make either compost extract or compost tea. Okay, and there, these are distinctly different from each other simply by the fact that um, extract doesn't have any additional microbe foods added to it. So they both should be, at least, uh, for the most part, aerated and brewed like a tea. So you would take your finished compost, put it in a bag, okay, a mesh bag, and there are many out there from many retailers that you can find. <laughs> Uh, that are great stuff. So you put your composted material in that bag. I use a conical brew tank. Some people just put it in a five gallon bucket. The key to, to these uh, liquid amendments is to keep everything full of oxygen. So I aerate as I am pulling apart and brewing that extract. So you put your tea bag in your water that is then has an air pump that pumps water into your five gallon bucket or into your conical um, brew tank. And you wanna kind of squeeze and work and massage that material in the bag to help break, to help get those microbes off of the organic material and uh, get those nutrients solubilized and get everything, those good humic and fulvic acids solubilized. Now, if you just do that part and you create the extract, you know, you can bubble for five minutes, you can bubble for 30 minutes. It depends on when you're going to use the material and how long you're going to expect it to sit on the shelf or to be stored. So if you are at home and you're, or you're a small farmer, we recommend just using, just brewing what you're going to use. Same thing with tea, but with extract, do the same thing. Just brew what you're going to use while extract has a little bit higher shelf life because there's no microbe foods added. The, the tea needs to be used in four to eight hours after brewing for the most part. Um, so, so you need to use the tea pretty quick. So let's talk about tea a little bit. Tea is done the same way. So you put the put compost in a mesh bag in a, you know, some receptacle of water that's getting uh, aerated. And then with a tea, you would add different foods based on the microbes that you want to grow. Right, so you want to grow populations of beneficial microbes. You got to feed them the particular food that they like. So, humic acids—that's a great fungal food. Um, blackstrap molasses—that's a good bacteria and fungal food. You know, different things that you add to the brew will grow different populations. So, a lot of people will say, "Hey, we are growing X, Y, or Z. So let's brew a tea." that corresponds with what microbiology we really need in that space. Mm -hmm. okay. So it can help you kind of balloon um, microbe numbers quickly. Like I said, it doesn't have a high shelf life and can quickly uh, turn into a, a bacterial bloom. Mm -hmm. So do know what, you know, really learn how to do this mm -hmm. from a trusted source. Right. Um, before you just kind of jump into just dumping stuff in your brew. Mm -hmm. uh, the extract is great for soil drenches, especially mm -hmm. the tea, and, and it can be foliar sprayed as well. The tea is going to probably stick to your leaves and your foliar application a little bit better because of the microbe foods mm -hmm. um, and the increase in bacteria uh, means a lot of bacteria well, all bacteria, the beneficial guys will produce alkaline glues. And so hmm. um, this can help, yeah, using the microbe food and uh, those glues, they can create aggregation on leaves and stems a little bit better. So, yeah, it just really depends on what you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, we create, we do, we brew teas and extracts. The only thing that we sell at our Mississippi State Farmers Market is our extracts because of the shelf life thing, but right. we do brew to order for farms mm -hmm. and uh, backyard gardeners. That seems like a great service because I know that uh, 
I personally am an extremely lazy composter. <laughs> <laughs> mm. And, but I would love to have, you know, really high quality stuff available. I know most farmers are really good at, you know, one thing, but maybe they don't have the, the skills or the equipment or time to, to brew their own high quality tea, but it's great that they can, they can have that partnership with you um, to get what mm. they need. Um, because I know it's it's probably with a product like that with such a short shelf life, you really can't just go to the farmer's co-op and, and pick it up, you know. <laughs> it really makes logistics pretty tough, yeah. but it does it does become a highly sought after product in terms of um, results and how you can hone in on what exactly what crop you're trying to treat. Mm -hmm. or what space you're trying to treat right. um, so you can really tailor your brew to to that and this you know these are things that are being researched now this is you know soil science is young and we, yeah. we there's a lot that most of the things we don't know yeah. <laughs> you know it's and so, <laughs> so a lot of exactly it's so a lot of this is is trial and error by nonprofits, by farming organizations by organizations like mine um, that are learning and putting the science to the test. Mm -hmm. um, well, I really could talk about this all day long, but <laughs> uh, we should probably wrap it up soon. So I just wanted to ask you what resources that you really like that are out there. You mentioned those books, Teaming with Microbes and, mm -hmm. and Teaming with Fungi. Um, what are some other books or websites or um, other resources you would recommend to people who are interested in learning more about composting, worm composting, all of that kind of thing? Yeah, thanks for asking that. And, you know, one thing I'll encourage people to do on their own as well is if you're really interested in this type of stuff, you need to get your microscope chops down, right? You need to work with a microscope. You need to find some space that you can either uh, rent some time there or borrow some space at a school or buy your own microscope um, because this that's how you take it a little bit to the next level. But some of the resources that I love, uh, how I got started really, uh, if you guys in the Southeast wanna check out Texas Worm Ranch, uh, Heather Rinaldi does an amazing job at their um, unique system. I really fashion a lot of what I do after what she does. You know, I consider myself a mouthpiece. You know, I, a lot of folks are doing the studies. I'm just blurting it out to you. And, um, <laughs> you know, while we do some unique stuff, these folks are really at the, the cutting edge. Rhonda, Dr. Rhonda Sherman at NC State, um, mm -hmm. as far as vermicomposting, she she wrote a recent book, um, The Worm Farmer's Handbook, incredible resource for beginners and advanced folks. Dr. Norman Ericon, he's really doing some incredible research on vermicomposting. Uh, he's at University of Hawaii at Hilo, I believe, and he's done a lot of work on auxins and application rates of extracts and growth rate, just a lot of neat stuff there. Of course, Dr. Elaine Ingham and the Soil Food Web, mm -hmm. um, always at the cutting edge of, of, you know, pushing what are standards and really checking things under the microscope and um, learning different stuff about our, our soil and uh, the life in it and how important these things are. Uh, Jeff Lowenfels, which we talked about before with all the teaming books. Um, Chris Trump. He's doing some really cool stuff with KNF or Korean Natural Farming. Mm. So if uh, you haven't checked Korean Natural Farming out, please check them out. They really do a lot of work with indigenous microorganisms, which are so important to understanding um, your particular climate, your particular area, what microbes work well where you are. Mm -hmm. uh, they do. It's just incredible information there. Uh, Will Allen. He's uh, done great stuff. He is the, uh, he wrote recently the Good Food Revolution mm -hmm. and uh, just a really good resource for folks that are maybe in urban settings that want to do urban farming. Uh, that's, we are set up in an old industrial spot here in Jackson. And mm -hmm. so what we do is uh, all urban 
urban farming. So we'll really blaze the trail there. Great. And of course, of course, the OG Mary Appleoff, right? If you're talking about worm composting, she she's the OG worm composter. So, okay, um, <laughs> I don't know that, but her name. <laughs> yeah, Mary Appleoff. Yeah, she okay. she was in the '70s doing this. Okay. So, just yeah, really dig in there if you want to learn a little bit more. Awesome. Well, I will try and, and find those links for people and put them um, on our website below the podcast so that, that people can find those resources easily because that that does sound like you just um, saved people a lot of time at the library <laughs> right. by listing yeah. those. So. No, no, there are so many valuable workshops, especially Heather and that crew at, in uh, North Texas. They they do a ton of uh, really great basic composting and gardening workshops and vermicomposting. So definitely check them out for, for that too. Oh, I'm sorry, Nina, one more thing, because I did mention bioanalysis. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of organizations out there that will do your bioanalysis. It's so important when you're getting started in something like this to be able to monitor as you go. Am I doing mm. this right? Mm. Have I... <laughs> Have I succeeded in this in this enterprise? And being able right. to measure that um, using these labs, or if if they, people get really into it, getting their getting their own microscopes and things like that. So it's great to have those indicators to to lead you lead you in a in a more scientific way instead of just guessing. <laughs> I right. guess it looks good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, using what we know and building on that is that's that's our everyday struggle. So yeah, yeah. And <laughs> I mean, I always encourage people to sort of be their own scientists because everybody's mm. farm is different. All yeah. the microorganisms are different depending on where, where people are. Uh, you know, their feedstock that is available to them is going to vary depending on where mm -hmm. they are. So you really have to, you can't follow a, a prescription. You know, you you can, you know, learn the bit, the principles and then, and then, you know, apply them, you know, using your own eyes and, and your own uh, powers of observation to, to know whether you're doing it properly. That's right. So That's right. I always encourage that. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us? Any parting thoughts, uh, words of encouragement, things like that? When I get bogged down in the day-to-day, -day, the turning of compost and the <laughs> measuring of everything and the laboring on the farm, you know, I, I turn to a couple of folks and Dr. Vandana Shiva has lots of great inspiration Mm -hmm. um, for farming community and food access and food justice stuff. And it really pushes the envelope and reminds me why we're doing this and why it's so important. And taking that time and reflection, especially um, thinking about with intention, our waste and how we can, you know, our little part that we make uh, happen in this big macro environment what are we doing on the micro side? How do we mimic the microbiology on the scale that we can't see and utilize those micro pieces to build and create a better macro environment for us all? Thank you. That That's great, great inspiration. She is a, definitely a role model. So thank you so much. Uh, I have learned so much here today and I seriously could talk all day about this. So <laughs> we <Same>. might have to, <laughs> we might have to do a part two sometime in the future, but uh, thank you so much for your time today. I've really enjoyed this and I, and I hope other people have, have gotten inspired to dive into composting or, or worm composting and, and really making use of that, the resource that, that is food waste and food scraps and, and, and all of that. So thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much, Nina. And to all you soon to be worm composters, <laughs> just get started and you'll get to worming in no time. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. Additional information about this episode and related resources can be found at atra.incat.org. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe to Voices from the Field wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Rich Myers. 
ATRA, Voices from the Field, is produced by the National Center for Appropriate Technology, headquartered in Butte, Montana. It's supported by the USDA Rural Business Cooperative Service as part of NCAT's ATRA Sustainable Agriculture Program. Any opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this recording are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of the USDA or NCAT. We'll catch you again next week, and until then, keep on farming.